Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Coffee Microcaps uh, morning meeting. This is the actually the 10th uh, edition in the series and you're all very welcome to this morning's meeting. I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of housekeeping slides before I hand over to our first presenter. Um, just run through a disclaimer. Um, as I said, you're very welcome to this morning's meeting. I'm Mark Tobin, the founder of Coffee Microcaps. For anybody who hasn't joined us in one of our either in-person events or one of the previous nine virtual events, um, just to give a quick overview of the structure of the webinar before we start, we do two companies roughly every fortnight in an hour. Uh, each company presents in a 30-minute slot, so we're going to have a 20-minute presentation and we try and keep 10 minutes open for Q&A at the end. If, if any of the attendees do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box on your control panel, not in the chat box. Um, and then I'll try and put as many questions to our presenter in the, in the time allowed. Uh, if I don't get to your question, uh, I do apologize. Please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel, probably on Saturday. So if there's anything the presenter skipped over quickly or you want to watch one of our previous uh, webinars, um, that's the place to, to check it out. Um, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter if you aren't already. As I said, YouTube for this recording and all previous webinar recordings. Uh, we're on LinkedIn for some additional long form content that uh, is not uh, restricted by the characters on Twitter. And I also run a subscription newsletter, which can be accessed via the, the Substack newsletter platform. So our first presenter this morning is going to be Mr. Wayne Hooper from Laser Bond. And then just to let you know, coming up after Wayne, we're going to have Mr. David Kaspari and Mr. Stuart Halls from Janice and Education. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Wayne. So when I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let you know as soon as I can see the cover slide of your presentation. Yeah, I can uh, see your cover slide now, Wayne. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, before we start, Matthew Twist, our CFO, is also with me. So, um, yeah. Good so, morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Mark, in presenting to the Coffee Microcaps. It's, uh, it's going to be our pleasure. So, about laser bond. I don't know what's happening here. Isn't it? Sorry, I apologize, I'm having trouble stepping through. I'll start off with this opening slide just to, as a teaser um, about the company. We've been, we've been listed a while. Uh, we're growing very strongly. We've got some unique technology, a very low debt with a strong cash flow. We've had strong growth over the last four, four years, um, which is, you know, we're, we're going, and we're planning to uh, continue that growth. We've recently uh, expanded into Victoria. Uh, that allows us to accelerate the growth in, in this financial year. Uh, and we're very well positioned to continue that. Bit of a teaser there. So what do we do? We're about, we capital intensive industries, I'm talking mining, minerals processing, heavy transport such as rail, um, Genera electricity generation, steel making, aluminium making. They've all got a capital, they're capital intensive and they've got equipment that operates in pretty severe environments. And components wear out. When they wear out, they've got to, uh, they lose efficiency of the equipment. Uh, they need to, when they're completely worn out, they need to actually uh, take the equipment out of service and replace those parts. And what we're about is actually increasing the life of those wearing components so that they live a, they deliver reduced operating costs to our customers, increased productivity, uh, just better results all around. And we use a range of techniques that's categorised as what we call surface engineering. So surface engineering is about reducing wear or, or corrosion or all the effects of deterioration of the product. So all of that occurs at the surface. So if you 
actually modify the working surfaces to uh, resist that environment in which they're operating, you can dramatically extend the life. So we're talking about advanced materials and technologies that apply these materials to your run-of-the-mill materials such as steel um, to deliver the um, best results for our customers. There's a whole range of materials and a, a number of techniques we use to apply them and we're all about delivering the best results. We optimise our materials and our processes to deliver the maximum benefit for our customers, uh, which then reflects in our sales. So in terms of benefits, we, we've divisionalised the company into, into three main divisions, uh, with a fourth one for R&D. Our services division is about reclamation of worn parts for these capital intensive industry, usually delivering better than new performance. So the reclaimed part is actually better than the original part. Increasing the life by up to 10 times before they have to uh, to replace that part again or have it rebuilt. Our products division is actually about re manufacturing components that are a consumable, but they're delivering uh, longer life consumable. So they're actually, again, up to 10 times a standard consumable. Uh, so we export products uh, globally, uh, both directly and through our large LEM customers. So, our customers, the end users, benefit from longer maintenance cycles and reduced downtime, higher efficiency while they're running so they get better productivity from their equipment, reduced inventory of spares, uh, and you know, improved product quality as well. So the fact that the components aren't worn often means that they, they have less scrap, in, you know, say the steel making process, they don't have to redo some work also, it improves the supply chain risks. From a maintenance point of view, particularly say in mining applications, the reducing the frequency of maintenance cycle also delivers workplace health and safety benefits. So there is a recognition that you know, every time they have to pull some of these large pieces of equipment apart to replace components, there are some risks associated with that. Society benefits because we're actually reusing components rather than scrapping them. And the energy footprint in reclaiming a component, or the carbon footprint in reclaiming a component is far less, you know, 30 times less than what it is in actually manufacturing that steel component in the beginning. That's typical, of course, it's not across the board. So we reduce uh, usage of uh, materials and energy for the whole for society. Importantly, our equipment manufacturing company customers are able to differentiate their product offering. So by offering a higher performance product, a longer lasting product, the customers uh, get the benefits and it allows them to differentiate, the, the, our customers to differentiate themselves. So there's our division, the services division, the product divisions I've already talked about, they're diagonally opposite there. Down the bottom, we have the technology division. What we've done over the last 20 years is develop our laser bond plating process to the point where we are recognised as a global leader in this industry. We're able to, we actually design and build our own equipment. Uh, when we first started, we certainly couldn't get anyone to build what we needed at that time. So we designed and built it. So we now have, and we've spent 20 years or more developing our service engineering technology through our R&D um, to deliver the best results. So that allows us then to license our technology uh, to other players around the world um, and provide the equipment for that process. And as I mentioned, R&D has always been a strong part of what we do. Uh, delivering the best results is for our customers is what we always aim to do to get, the, uh, to get them coming back for, for other applications. So this is a case study about steel mill rolls. Um, we actually do reclamation work on steel mill rolls. Blue Scope Steel has been a customer for a long time, as, as has Liberty One Steel, which has um, you know, changed names a few times. So steel, steel mill rolls, uh, they benefit from surface engineering the product. It means that they can keep the, the mill running for longer before having to change these rolls. 
they're not generally an expensive item compared to what they're producing, but the fact that they can make them last means they get much higher productivity out of their equipment. And these sort of, you know, in these mills, they're talking, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per hour of lost production while they do any maintenance. And so it makes a big difference. We've been able to uh, dramatically extend the life of these components and we're now uh, exporting uh, rolls to North American markets and that's growing. Uh, we're also growing, continuing to grow the Australian market. So the, the benefit of the North American market is 15 to 20 times the size of the Australian market. And they've got lots of uh, mills around that uh, have, you know, lots of wear problems. So it's a, it's streaming out for development. And that's what we're, you know, we're doing now. We're ex exporting there and growing that business. So our customers are very happy in that area. This is one we're very excited about. This is a new development, or relatively new. We spent the last three, four years developing a low cost alternative to hard chrome. Now, hard chrome has been a surface engineering technique that's been around for a long time, but it's and but it uses very toxic chemicals, uh, known as hexavalent chromium or chromium six. Uh, it's carcinogenic and, you know, it's a, from an environmental point of view, it's hazardous. So regulators around the world are cracking down on hard chrome uh, as a... Hi, Wayne, we've just lost your audio there, sorry. Where, and it's been proven by independent testing at the University of South Australia. Uh, we eliminate some of the problems such as the cracking in the chrome, uh, which means it's not suitable in corrosion environment. So we've got a solution that's much more corrosion protective uh, or protective against corrosion and much more protective against wear at a lower cost um, and higher productivity. So it's, we're launching that as a, not only our own product, but as a licensing revenue in this financial year, or sorry, in the first half of this financial year. For, for a good understanding of the issues created by the hexavalent chromium, um, the Aaron Brockovich movie um, was about this same issue. Yeah, so, and when was that? In the 90s, I think, yes, Aaron Brockovich, so. that movie was a true story about pollution from hexavalent chromium. So we deal with a lot of large clients and suppliers to large clients, right? but uh, you know, all of these industries have all these customers have wear problems and we actually help deliver, uh, reduce costs to them. So in terms of our financial performance, we've been largely effect, unaffected by COVID-19 and by largely unaffected, I mean with our operations continued, uh, our revenue for our core products and services division combined was up by 8.3%, nearly 15% in the services division in FY20. Uh, and really level pegging in the products division. Products division was a little somewhat affected by our inability to travel to uh, our North American market, but nonetheless, we still had um, some growth in order. So the products division did have growth. Uh, as explained, you can see in the bottom right graph, the, the, the orders coming in uh, by half year in the products division. And the growth was, uh, there were some delays because of the change of specification of one of our OEM customers in that, in that division, which meant there were some supply chain delays when they, they changed their materials. So they, the increased revenue for that customer will actually, you know, was occurring in the first quarter of this financial year. So we still had underlying growth in both of those divisions despite COVID. Uh, what it also, what COVID did mean is that on the technology sales, we were banking on a technology sale in FY20. Uh, we weren't able to achieve one because we couldn't travel to visit customers and they couldn't travel to visit us. And, and you know, for, the, for the most part, we need to demonstrate to them how, what we do and how we do it so that they you know, uh, get across the line there. Our EBITDA was up by 26%, mainly as a result of the ASB 16 changes which require recognition of right of use assets. 
However, the underlying EBITDA is still increased by 10.4, and that's fully explained in our annual report. So 10.4% growth in underlying EBITDA. We finalised the acquisition of a service engineering company in Victoria that has thermal spraying technology, which we also use. We'll be putting our laser um, bond cladding the laser bond cladding technology into the Victorian operations and expanding down there. Uh, and that's happening right now. Well, the, the equipment will go in in the first quarter of calendar year 21. So the third, third quarter of this financial year. This uh, table shows the growth over the last uh, four years, strong growth across the board. FY20 was overall the revenue was in line with FY19, as I mentioned, products and services division up, no technology sales left. Whereas FY19 had about 2.4 million of a technology sale. So still strong growth in the underlying business and we're positioned uh, very strongly for growth. Now, just a bit more about the acquisition. We, United Surface Technology was a Started as like Razor Bond did a family company um, some 30 years ago or a bit longer uh, in using thermal spray technology. We also use thermal spray technology. We've got the equipment and the people uh, that operate that equipment uh, to do some of the work type of work we do. And as I mentioned earlier, Razor Bond technology we bolted onto that acquisition um, and you know this financial year and delivering revenue uh, in the second half of the year from that technology. So it's a complementary business. Uh, the reason for the acquisition is because of the, the supporting equipment and the people. So we've got the skilled labour there. Uh, obviously, we will grow that labour force with our technology as well. Um, but train and we'll be training them in our technology. We expect about $4 million revenue, or we expect $4 million revenue from that um, business in FY21 and growing from there. So our growth strategy, we're, we've got, we, we're the largest surface engineering business in the country. Uh, we've got significant economies of scales. We have a strategic plan to reach $40 million revenue by FY22. Uh, we've got three operations covering the south east of Australia. We're continuing to grow the applications for our services and products. Uh, we're getting export growth uh, to the products division for steel mill rolls and uh, our OEM customers. Uh, and we're delivering, we're planning to deliver a number of new products. So international growth as well through licensing the technology to a range of industries, including um, large OEMs operating in you know, other continents that can benefit from our surface engineering technology. We're entering the market for hard chrome placement in FY21, and we're, there's multiple acquisition opportunities for organic growth for geographic expansion uh, in Australia. So we've got the, the best, best product offering in this area and strong plans for growth. We're going to deliver on that. So in summary, we've been around for 28 years, since 1992, we've been listed since 2007. Uh, we've spent a lot of time developing our, our technology and our uh, service offering. We've got proprietary solutions. There's high barriers to entry because of the equipment that we design and build in-house, as well as the, the, uh, the technology, the IP that we have that allows us to um, produce for our customers. So multiple revenue streams, as you, meant, you know, we mentioned the, the various divisions, um, as well as geographies. Uh, we've got strong IP, we've got patents on a few of our processes. We've got certainly a lot of uh, embedded knowledge in our business that is, that is well protected. So we're primed to continue the, our growth, our strong growth. And, um, you know, our balance sheet for a micro cap is very strong. We've got negligible debt. Uh, no goodwill, uh, we've got cash available, we're in position for growth. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, happy to receive any questions. Thank uh, you. 
Yeah, thanks, Wayne. You've finished um, bang on time. Um, we've got one question through the Q&A and then a, a couple of others are actually emailed in uh, ahead of time. Uh, is there plans to enter new manufacturing verticals and in industries that use surface engineering like battery storage or battery materials as one? Battery storage and battery materials. Um, there are no plans at this stage, but certainly if there, if there's, if there are applications of our technology in that area, then we will certainly look into it. Yeah, great. So we, we, we've been mainly working in the wear and corrosion protection for capital intensive industries. Um, so that's what we do. And then just going back to the, the acquisition, um, gross margins for that business, should it be similar to, um, I guess, the division it's going into or where, where should people think about margins in that business? Margins for that business are very similar to Laserbond's current facilities in New South Wales and South Australia. They, their, their history is a little bit lower, but we intend, them to, intend to bring that division up to our standard. So that's through um, productivity gains and, and you know better product offering for our you know customers as well. So yeah, they'll be very similar GP, same basically the same as what we're currently doing. Yeah. Great. And then another question that was emailed in ahead of time. Um, can you give a rough breakdown of kind of what each uh, division should be contributing revenue wise to get to that forty million that you um, are aiming for in FY twenty two? Yes, we can. Matt's just got a calculator out. So we do have these figures on our plan, but I haven't got it in front of me. Okay. Doesn't have to be exact, Matt. It's just kind of no, ballpark. No. It would. It would be approximately forty percent services, fifty mm percent -hmm. products. And ten percent technology. Okay, great. Um, another one. Then you got four million of cash at the end of FY twenty. Um, somebody's just wondering: is that sufficient to fund kind of national and international expansion that you you've talked about? Not necessarily. It depends on the um, the acquisition. So. Yeah, we've currently got three operations. Our, our second one was in Adelaide. You know, we started in Sydney. The second one was in Adelaide. That was a greenfield expansion um, in that we, you know, we just set it up from scratch. Uh, the challenge with that is it takes a while to actually get all the equipment in, um, get the people, get them trained up, grow the business. So our strategy for, our current strategy for, further expansion is to actually acquire a company that has, if they're not in the surface engineering field, but they're in the general um, machining engineering field. So they have some of the equipment or all of the, a lot of the equipment that we, we need to support our surface engineering and we go from there. So the amount of money just depends on the, on the cost of those, you know, what we need to pay for those companies, which is, you know, typically a, a multiple of their profits. So it depends how, how large they are. Um, so yeah, not necessarily, it just depends. But certainly the Victorian expansion was funded from our own uh, resources. Okay. And then just a question on, I guess, the, the patents and the defensibility of the technology. I mean, how, these, how easy or difficult would it be to replicate? Um, the question is, for example, why would a pers prospective licensee not develop their own capacity or is it a kind of, you know, too many, I guess, smarts or things involved in the process that make that difficult? There certainly is. Look, the, why would they not develop their own? Well, that's an option for them, right? There's no, there's no doubt in that, but they have to spend the time and the resources getting the highest performance from the, um, in using the, you know, developing the material. So we, we have a lot of proprietary materials we source from uh, around the world uh, that 
and we know how to run the equipment and for each sub for each material that we're applying the coating to get you know we know how to get the performance out of that surface engineering so what i'm saying is there's a lot of intellectual property in how to go about it and which materials to use so certainly um you know, we, we don't we don't have the whole technology patented. We can't do that. Uh, but what we can do is uh, get the best performance for our customers. And that's how we've been able to, um, you know, license the technology, for example, to the to our um, you know our licensee in the UK. I mean, there's other laser cladding people in Europe, um, but they they came to us because we delivered the performance that they need, and they needed that technology in their products. Great. And then if we just take one final one, when uh, one of our eagle-eyed attendees said they saw a, a job ad for a role in, in WA, they're just wondering, is that for the products focus, given that you, you don't have a workshop locally there? Um, it's for both. It's for services and products. And, um, you know, our expansion strategy is about that market as well. You do have an eagle eye attendee, yes. <laughs> so, um, and some of them who like to do a lot of due diligence, obviously. Yeah, that's good. No, I understand. And, um, and you know, we welcome it. Now, we've got plans to expand, uh, you know, to help grow our South Australian operation from more work out of WA, as well as, um, you know, expansion into the WA market as we grow there. Okay, great. Okay, Wayne, uh, Matt, I think we'll leave it there. Listen, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, I don't think we have any further questions. Let me just double check. No, we don't. Um, and yeah, please uh, just let anybody know if they want to get in touch, if they've got any follow-up questions, uh, what's, the, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Um, yeah, via email, uh, be easy. Uh, Wayne H, W A Y N E H, at laserbond.com.au. Great, thanks very much. Wayne, if you can please stop sharing your screen and uh, we'll just get set here for the uh, next presenter. My apologies. Um, there, you go. there you go. Thank you. Perfect. Appreciate the ability to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. And right on cue, I have uh, David Kaspari, the CEO of Janison. David, I can see the cover slide of your screen, so uh, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, Mark. Um, just testing that you can you can hear uh, me loud and clear. Uh, Kennedy, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to everybody who's joined today. Um, I'm the CEO of Janison. I'm joined by Stuart Halls, um, who is um, our, our CFO. And uh, Stuart and I will, will share some of the presenting uh, duties um, over the course of the next half hour. Uh, we've prepared some materials that um, I hope will be uh, valuable both for people that really um, um, haven't been uh, following our story, but also an update for those who know us uh, better and uh, it'll probably take us about you know 15 to 20 minutes to take you through it but we want to make sure uh, there's an opportunity for uh, any feedback and any questions that you might um, have uh, but at a very headline um, level uh, for those of you who don't know us Janison is a 20 year old um, um, organization um, listed about three year, three years ago um, and our future our strategic focus is very much in the digital assessment space uh, focused primarily as the first among equals in schools, uh, but also in, uh, in higher education. And we'll take you through what assessments actually uh, is defined as in, in the upcoming uh, comments. Uh, in terms of our FY20 performance, um, certainly the market is, has, um, has reacted positively to a robust performance. And I think on the right, without going through all of the metrics, I can see, I think you can see evidence of, um, you know, growth in all of the key metrics, particularly um, the, the growth, the 62% growth in our platform 
revenue in our assessments business, which is very much the core of our future. But you can also see um, gross margins um, significantly improving, cash improving, et cetera, which is really strong evidence of this move that we're making into highly scalable, highly repeatable, uh, recurring revenue platform um, economics. Um, and you know, as, as we look forward, the addressable market is extraordinary. In fact, very difficult to define at this stage, but undoubtedly being accelerated by the COVID dynamics. Uh, we'll take you through um, our insights platform, but the insights platform is our core assessment platform. And it's now at a point where we've been able to prove the capability globally at scale with some very significant clients. And that really now presents us with the opportunities to, uh, to accelerate our scaling into the market. Um, final comment I'd make is, you know, as we look out uh, to FY21, you know, we see a very favourable out, um, um, outlook, although one part of our business continues to be COVID dependent, but uh, we are seeing expansion on all of our key financial uh, metrics. For those of you who don't um, know us well, I would like to very briefly help define what, um, what assessments are and our place in, in the market on this. Um, but our focus, as I said before, is on developing and delivering digital assessments globally on our Janison Insights platform. Insights is the platform we're talking about. It's a highly secure, digital assessment platform that really transforms the assessment experience. And at its most simple, it takes traditional pen and paper assessments digital, but in, in actual fact, it goes far further um, because uh, the assessment ecosystem is not just about an exam. Uh, it starts with the authoring of an assessment, um, the development of questions, pulling them together into an assessment, running the exam event, but then also the marking of the event, the reporting of the event and the analysis um, of the event and of the assessment. And uh, if you think about what that means in a school environment, for example, it's actually a very costly um, thing to do by hand, um, you know, by, by a school um, by themselves. And um, the Insights platform is essentially a full suite of tools that allow for authoring, remote delivery, reporting, analysis for exams as they are taken digitally, uh, taken digital. But it's not just about taking what's a traditional pen and paper exam and then replicating it uh, digitally. It actually um, creates what we call authentic tests. And this is um, allowing the embedding of multimedia, much more rich experiences that augment traditional question types. Um, and we've been, um, uh, our Insights uh, platform has seen us deliver more than 10 million tests to more than 4 million students, and that continues to accelerate. Um, and, you know, some of the most sophisticated customers in the world have helped us develop it. I'd, I'd call out, obviously, um, NAPLAN um, and the digitisation of NAPLAN, but also our customers um, like um, ITE, um, which is in Singapore, and obviously the Singapore uh, expectations around quality and capabilities are extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily high. Most recently, key wins um, uh, in the University of London, when we, where we are running tests, not just in London, but in 55 countries simultaneously, uh, are really proving out um, the capability of uh, the Insights platform. And you can see the evidence of um, the acceleration of digital um, in our, you know, rapidly accelerate candidate numbers, but also rapidly accelerating test numbers. Um, it's fair to say that when NAPLAN um, is run um, this financial year, next calendar year, and, um, and we see the, um, the other tests that we've, um, and assessments that we've announced, whether it be, um, um, the University of London or various others, you can you can expect to see an acceleration of the momentum of both tests delivered um, and number of candidates on a year on year basis. To clarify where our focus is, we actually um, we actually talk about um, 
80, 80, 80 as a, um, just as a headline in the way you can understand the nature of our business. Um, we aspire over the next three to five years to have a business that is 80% schools, 80% recurring revenue, the remainder being services, um, and 80% um, in assessment products and platforms. And as I said, uh, I'll focus on schools because really schools is the first among equals. And our aim is to be able to support students, schools and education departments globally by providing all, a full suite of the, um, the diagnostics, the measurement, um, the assessments, the benchmarks, all of the tools that they need um, to you know, enable that assessment um, ecosystem. Uh, while schools is our focus, higher ed is a rapidly accelerating um, space as well. And I might talk about higher ed in the context of what COVID is doing to our marketplace. Um, I, I think most people, um, you know, that take an interest in what's going on in schools and higher ed understand that uh, the likes of school and um, university campus closures um, and the need for education to continue remotely has dramatically accelerated the digitization of student learning um, and assessments and new teaching and learning habits are now being formed. And it's our view that's, and it's mirrored by, you know, all of our clients and experts that, you know, as, as um, uh, education goes back to in person and back to on campus, um, that there will be a new norm. Um, and di the digital experience will be heavily integrated into all parts of teaching, learning um, and assessment. Um, and the survey, um, uh, the survey results on the right are particularly uh, interesting and current. Um, that survey was done on the 4th of August, so uh, only about six weeks ago by the Australian Council on Open Distance and E-Learning. Um, and they asked the question, in this case of higher education, uh, in light of COVID, um, what are those 50 institutions' intentions on um, their future exam needs, particularly in relation to digitisation? And 75% of them, 37 out of 50, saying that in light of COVID, they need to reconsider end to end the way they deliver um, exams, the way they author exams, to make sure that they continue to operate as a, as a ongoing concern should an event like this happen again. Um, so in light of the market opportunity um, and the acceleration, you know, I joined the organisation 120 days ago and the board has given a very clear mandate um, to accelerate uh, our investments to capture the market opportunity that we uh, that is now very clear for us, and we see four levers. Um, you know, very you know, very simplified um, uh, to to take our existing business franchises and to grow share. And Stuart in a moment will talk about uh, two of those very significant franchises, but also to invest in in um, sales and marketing to drive acquisition of new customers and. Um, we've stated that we're going to double our investment in sales and marketing from 8% to 16% of revenue this financial year. Simultaneously, we now know that the marketplace is ready for the transition of, away from um, uh, customised solutions to, um, to standardised platform solutions that are configurable. And so we're accelerating the development of what we already have. But to accelerate scale and scale our business requires us to actually simplify our operations um, and to improve our execution strength. And those two things um, are well underway um, in the last 120 days. And indeed, the last 120 days um, have been very productive. Um, you know, obviously, we've navigated COVID and I'm very proud of the team in the way that they uh, trimmed but also pivoted to new opportunities. Um, I joined it actually in the, seven, the second week. Uh, we did a capital raise. Um, that's helped us fund um, our investment in sales and marketing in the platform. I will talk and I'll get Stu to talk about a key strategic acquisition, uh, but we also entered into a strategic partnership with Desire to Learn. We opened a new headquarters and we've finished the build of our executive team, uh, three of which have joined in the last 
um, 90 days um, and we're now complete uh, a team of 10 of which pleasingly 50% uh, are female and 50% are male. Stu, um, can you just, uh, uh, just generally share um, a couple of the highlights of, uh, our, uh, of our current uh, existing businesses being, in this case, University of New South Wales, Global Acquisition, but then PISA. Yeah, sure, certainly. Thanks, David. So um, this was an acquisition we made, uh, which Anderson made in, in uh, June of this year, uh, so not long ago. Uh, it's a, uh, a business division of the University of New South Wales, Global, uh, and largely it's a, it's, it's, it's a suite of four products for schools uh, in the assessment space. And predominantly this ICAST test that some of you may be quite familiar with. It's a test that's been around for about 30, 30 years. It's a competition. It's sort of an elite uh, competition for, uh, for school kids between um, 2 and 12. And uh, we acquired the business in this asset in, in June. And um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal asset. It's basically um, uh, it's a test that gets built every year. It's a set of questions that are developed by a team of psychometricians and statisticians that have come across with, uh, with the acquisition to Janison. And, um, and they produce an extremely high quality test, one that is, uh, is almost unrivaled around the world uh, in terms of quality. And, um, and it's delivered uh, across half of all schools in Australia and about 15 countries around the world. And um, the way it works, it's sort of like an infrastructure asset in the way that uh, the test is developed throughout the year, uh, costs around about five to $6 million to produce and design the test sort of gives you an idea of, of the complexity of, of, uh, of, the, of the competition. Um, but once it's built uh, and then sold through to countries, uh, so to schools in Australia and beyond, uh, it really is sort of uh, uh, above that five million of break even, it really is incremental profit of, of sort of 90 plus percent margin. Uh, the only variable cost of, of increasing sales of above five million is, is a small amount of hosting. Um, it's, uh, it was it historically delivered about a million tests a year. It's currently fifteen dollars a test, so it's approximately a fifteen million dollar um, per annum recurring high margin revenue product for us. Uh, has gone through some changes. It's been paper based for the past twenty nine or thirty years, and we've um, uh, the university digitised it last year, and we, they saw some uh, difficulty in the transition, which um, uh, we're, we're now sort of recovering. And uh, obviously with COVID as well, we've seen a, a small uh, scale back in, in terms of uh, demand. So we expect this product to, to for us uh, to deliver about three to four million, three and a half million dollars this year, uh, and eventually growing back and recovering over the next 12, 24, 36 months, back to that sort of $15 million plus mark as we expand uh, the test and uh, deliver it um, more successfully than, than was done in the past. Um, Moving on to, the, so it's a good example of a, a schools-based assessment and through an acquisition that we made. Uh, another schools-based assessment that we do uh, is, a, is a partnership with the, with the OECD. So the OECD, as you may know, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development out of Paris, uh, obviously produced from very high, high standard, credible benchmarks around um, a number of things, including education. And uh, their, their source of, of their education data comes from uh, PISA. This is a program for international student assessment and uh, across 90 countries around the world, um, the OECD uh, captures information on schools and children and socioeconomic factors that they roll up into, a, uh, into their database. And in 2019, Janison was successful in winning a tender to digitize uh, and disrupt this, this uh, sort of paper-based uh, delivery or capture of information and uh, Janison now has a five-year exclusive agreement uh, to basically partner with the OECD and go around the world and sign up uh, or transition countries from their paper base to a, a digital online version of the assessment. Uh, it's delivered on the Janison Standard Insights platform or the assessment platform, uh, no customization, um, it's very low touch and um, it's a standard uh, set of questions uh, that gets delivered across every country uh, with some small localization for language, but otherwise a very standard uh, high margin um, uh, product for, for Janison. Uh, in terms of the sort of um, the unit economics, the, each, each country pays around about $100,000 per annum as a base, base minimum to have access to the test and to deliver it to around about 200 schools. And then uh, depending on the number of additional schools that the country chooses to run it in, the, the, the revenues uh, grow from there. 
So if you think about the sort of global market, there's about 90 countries at the moment doing PISA in some form, whether it's digital or paper-based. Um, at $100,000 per annum baseline, we're talking 9 million of annual recurring high margin revenue for Jenison. And um, obviously a lot of those countries, the larger countries in particular, will do many multiples of that 100,000 per annum. And so um, it, it really just goes up incrementally from sort of, or in multiples from the, the nine to 18 and, and so on. Uh, as we um, add new countries every year and we uh, expand into those countries with the PISA test. Um, what we've been doing up until now is we've signed seven countries so far, with Russia, Brazil, Portugal, uh, Pakistan, Thailand, and the USA. And, um, and that's really only been done by having uh, one person, sort of 10% of their time, uh, uh, you know, focused on this project or this rollout. And so what we've done now is we've actually hired a business development manager who's dedicated to rolling out PISA and has deep experience in PISA itself, the product, and um, is working with the OECD to help roll out this uh, across the world and accelerate the, um, the signing on of new countries uh, to, uh, to get us closer to that 90 uh, total. But there are also other countries as well that are being added to that 90 each year. So the market size is expanding every year. Um, and then obviously the opportunity for us as well is, is to establish relationships with uh, the Ministry of Education in each of these countries where we're signing them on to do PISA and, uh, and then have conversations from then on further to expand other, other tests that we can deliver like ICAS on the previous slide, which is a, a non-curriculum link test that can be delivered around the world and, and offers a, an amazing uh, product for each of these countries. Thank you, Stu. Um, I'd just make two points um, at, right now. Um, the two um, uh, case studies and highlights that Stuart just shared being um, uh, ICAS and PISA, uh, two great examples of our strategy around growing share of wallet in our existing business, because this is a business that um, is already generating revenue. Um, in the case of PISA, exclusive five-year relationship, um, growing that business is not about selling into new countries. It's about transitioning existing paper-based online in conjunction with OECD. So, uh, and the comment that Stu made about, you know, we're hiring, we've, we've bought in place a, a senior executive to lead PISA for us is an example of, of the investment in sales and marketing and the professionalization of our go-to-market model. Um, you know, moving from sort of a 10% focus on, an, on, a, on a franchise like this to 100% uh, will yield a very clear ROI in the immediate term and, and really set ourselves up for really capturing the addressable opportunity. So the last two examples were examples of about of uh, growing share of wallet and existing accounts. The other lens that I, I spoke about was you know, new customer acquisition. And uh, in particular, I'd highlight these, um, these four uh, in particular, the three of the University of London, the Department of Education and SCIO um, as critical um, reference customers that we won and delivered um, in Q4 that were on our standardised insights platform. And what that does is it evidences that the market is, is moving and that our platform is fit for purpose for the highest stakes exams you could imagine, whether it be end of semester exams um, for the University of London in 55 countries, or in the case of SCIO, which is the institution that runs all entrance examinations for the Czech Republic, university entrance examinations for the Czech Republic, delivering um, all university entrance examinations remote, proctored from home, in the middle of COVID very successfully. And finally, the, the New South Wales Department of Education, a long-standing existing customer, but you might have seen um, the, the recent award of the Selective Schools entrance examination that will be delivered um, by us in conjunction with Cambridge. Uh, so as we wrap up, and I wanna make sure that we do have time uh, for Q&A, we'll give you about 10 minutes. Um, summarizing what we just took you through um, as key the key growth drivers for this year you will see us um, deliver uh, incremental platform revenue in the order of 3.5 million dollars from icats you will see us drive growth through bringing on additional countries in piece of schools um, on the fourth one we talked about the acceleration of tests across all of um, our, our franchises and customers um, will drive additional revenue um, as more and more of those tests go, become digitised. And the one we didn't speak about, which is the third 
is the partnership with Desire to Learn, the number four by market share learning management system uh, company in the world based out of Canada. Um, you know, as they, as we partner uh, and fully technology integrate our platform so they can deliver um, high stakes exams as a part of their overall portfolio to their more than one and a half thousand existing customers. So as we open up for, for questions and I'll, I'll throw back to you, Mark, um, our summary is that, you know, we're very positive about our outlook this year. Um, in a marketplace, we are seeing um, accelerate as a result of the recent extraordinary COVID related events. Uh, we're very well positioned um, for, uh, um, to, you know, to address and win in this market, uh, demonstrated by the wins that we took you through. Um, despite that, there is a small risk or well, actually a risk that's, that's hard to determine, um, which is uh, based on whether universities go back to in-person exams in the first half of next calendar year. And we're watching that. Uh, that said, in the, in, in the face of the very clear market opportunity and the accelerating digitization of assessments, um, you know, we are leaning into the opportunity, doubling our investment in sales and marketing and accelerating our development of the insights platform. Um, at that point, we've got, I think, 10 minutes or a little bit less, Mark. So why don't I hand back to you? Okay, great. Um, yeah, we've got quite a few questions. Uh, I'll try and rattle through them as quickly as possible. Some obviously uh, came through now and I had a few emailed in before as well. Um, yeah, just on the sales cycle with countries for the PISA exam platform, like, I guess, how long does that normally take? And if they, you know, refuse to kind of take up your offering and, uh, and stick with paper, uh, the person's kind of wondering, you know, what's their kind of main reluctance for, for not moving to digital? Yeah, good question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, sales site is very quick. Um, it's usually, it is a sort of a three-way agreement between us, the OECD and each country, but it's a standard agreement. It's, it's replicated in every country. So it's uh, relatively straightforward. Um, and it takes anywhere between a few weeks and a couple of months uh, really to, to sort of sign up a new country. And, uh, and then the delivery of that usually happens within another couple of months just to give them some time to plan and, uh, and, and get technically ready. Um, we haven't seen any country decide to stay on paper. I mean, there's, it's sort of a no-brainer really. It's just the benefits um, far outweigh any costs of doing it. Um, speed, the richness of the questions and the, um, and the, and the sort of ability to distribute it uh, quickly and, and across the country um, is, is, um, is a major benefit for the countries and they, and they don't see any uh, downside in moving across. So we haven't seen anyone yet stay on paper or decide to uh, not go across to digital. The only additional comment I'd make is um, the distractions for certain government departments uh, internationally by COVID is is something that in the in the immediate term makes the transition a little bit pr less predictable we continue to see um, that happening through COVID, but um you know the the you know we just we can't have we don't have the predictability we, we usually would have in non covid times yeah and then i, I know you didn't really touch up but you did mention it in one of your slides um uh, where does Janison say in terms of competing against, you know, open learning or, or retech in the in the corporate learning market? Yeah, look, um, you know, obviously, I, I, I basically sort of break out into two. Firstly, we do have an, a, a a very mature learning platform that operates in the corporate market. Uh, it is a very competitive space, and you do, you know, we have some very large existing corporate customers think um, finance, very strong in financial services in Australia, for, for example. Um, in that space, um, that's not really an assessment space. Uh, in the assessment space, our focus is very much in the, in the education space. Firstly, schools. Secondly, um, higher education. Um, it's certainly in that space a far wider. There are competitors, but it's a far wider open uh, market than the learning, the LMS space, which is um, much busier. Um, so, you know, we, we don't see competition uh, and, and, you know, winning market share um, as our primary um, uh, constraint. The market is big enough um, for the competitive dynamic. So we want to grow into the addressable opportunity. Okay. And then just on the acquisition of education assessments, can you elaborate a little bit on the terms of the 
limited term license to use the UNSNW global brand? Yeah, sure. Um, look, the headline is we felt that um, medium term, um, the, the brand actually had the potential to, uh, to constrain uh, the growth opportunity. Um, and the reason for that is we see this very much as a global product. And the further you get away from Sydney um, and the brand radiation from Sydney, the less the brand resonance actually applies. Um, so you can expect us to continue to work with a, uh, you know, an elite higher education institution, but you should expect us to be partnering with a brand that resonates globally um, and potentially not a brand that originates uh, in the Australian in the Australian marketplace, and uh, you'll just uh, stay tuned. Um, you know, early in the in the next calendar year for an announcement in relation to that. And then uh, maybe a two part question. One is um, they're both linked. Is uh, can you just give a breakdown of where the register sits right now in terms of directors, insiders, other major holders? Given there's been a few capital raises, and then the second part of that question is. There's been no SPP or, or rights offering with the last three uh, raises. Uh, so the question is, you know, will that be considered in future an SPP or a rights offering if there is a, a need for one, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. I think when we took that as well as, as feedback in the last raising, I think it was a it was something that we acknowledged we, uh, in hindsight, probably should have done. We, we um, in the interest of time and uh, I guess the genesis of the raise was really just for an opportunity for um, John Baker, who was the strategic or the CEO of, of, of Desire to Learn, to uh, invest. Um, and um, it sort of it wasn't actually necessarily a need uh, for capital raising for, for working capital purposes. Um, and so, hence the decision to, to go with the sort of limited placement. Um, but absolutely, going forward, I think that, you know the board. I certainly spoke to the board myself, and we we recognise the need to do something more along the lines of an SPP or rights issue uh, in the future, uh, if if when if or when the need arises for another capital raise. In terms of the register, um, we've got about sixty percent free float at the moment. There's about two hundred and ten million shares on issue. Forty um, percent sit with. Uh, directors and um, the board, and predominantly with uh, Wayne Holden, who's the original founder. Uh, I don't think he has any sort of immediate intention to sell down. He, he obviously sees a lot, a lot more long-term value in, this, in the stock. Um, but yeah, there's around about, um, uh, as I say, 60% of stock is, uh, is free float and um, of a market cap of approximately 80 million now. Okay, great. And then another question, um, for in-person exams conducted by uh, GEM for universities, how many of the main customers are placed to restart exams, I guess, in this half, given, you know, where a lot of countries seem to be on the, on the way out of COVID, um, or at least major parts of countries, um, you know, the CFA exams are going to be done at a higher frequency. Um, you know, I guess what, what's going to be the impact of, uh, if you can gauge it at all of, of things restarting uh, in this half? Yeah, look, I'll make a couple of quick comments. Firstly, um, um, you're, you know, I think uh, you're a braver or other people are braver than people than I to predict how COVID will play out and, and, and some of the government responses, particularly in Australia to COVID. Um, you know, you, you, you make a very valid point. You know, uh, CFA is an important customer of ours and there's certainly... Um, stated very clearly that they want to go ahead. And so that's that's a great example of um, institutions that are moving ahead with in-person exams. Um, we're watching very carefully the higher ed space. Um, higher ed is conservative. Um, um, we have made assumptions in our outlook that um, that they would, they're not considering going back to in-person exams for the second half of this calendar year. So if that happens uh, and they accelerate in-person exams, then that represents uh, additional opportunity for us. Um, we've, we've, we're working on the assumption that for the, the you know, for the key revenue uh, window and the key exam window of Q4 of this financial year, which is the end of semester one exams, uh, that there will be a pathway back to in-person exams. Uh, but uh, that will really be very much dependent on government policy. Um, and, and, and how higher ed responds to it.
And then another quick one, just going back to Naplan, um, question saying there's been some talk of a major revamp of, of Naplan. Um, any comments on that or anything you've heard in discussions with government? Oh, look, I, uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on the discussions with government. What I could say to you is that, um, that if, you, if you were to digest that independent uh, report, or not independent, report by a number of the states um, um, on, on NAPLAN and their transition, um, almost all of what, um, what is proposed would be predicated on an accelerated move to digital and online because a num uh, many of the recommendations simply cannot be done um, on pen and paper. And obviously, we've now invested many years in the development of the platform. So uh, we're actually well placed, um, bringing, including bringing some of the capabilities that we've developed for uh, OECD PISA, for the selective exams in New South Wales. Um, we've already got the IP and the capability to implement the vast majority of the recommendations. So uh, we're well placed and we will be on the journey with that. And then a, a question that I find is perennially coming up um, these days, uh, cyber security. Um, you know, have you had to make a, a step change there um, as you've kind of gone more international and added in all these partnerships? Yes, uh, is, the, is the simple answer. We're very focused on, uh, on this. Obviously, if you think about, um, you know, high profile national events like NAPLAN, um, you know, reputation is important, um, quality of information is important, um, security is important. We care deeply about that. We think about, um, you know, where our data is, where it is, is held, how it's held. Um, and we've made significant incremental investments over the last um, 18 months to bolster our security posture. Great. Guys, we're going a little over time and unconscious the opening match has started on market. So let's leave it there. David, uh, Stuart, thanks very much for joining us. And um, as I said, the recording of this will be going up um, probably on Saturday morning. Uh, if anybody wants to watch the either the presentations back again. Mark, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you for all that joined today. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.